That's what I get to deal with all week. Actually, they have to put up with me, so it's not really that fair. But uh, good morning to you all. We are continuing our series uh, talking about being an unshakable people, uh, a church, um, a group of followers of Jesus that we want to be unshakable in our faith. And so if you would turn open to the book of Daniel, chapter 8, that's where we're going to be this morning. And Daniel, once again, gives us another dream, and it's kind of another weird dream, but, uh, but there's some really great practical application that we'll be able to take from it. And also, he makes it really easy for us, right? I know that last week it was pretty complicated, a lot of information, but that's Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 8 is another dream that takes two years, two years after Daniel's first dream that he gives us in Daniel chapter 7. And so I hope that you'll be able to walk along with me this morning as we reflect on this dream, talk about what it meant, and apply it to us. And really the overwhelming aspect of the dream is the idea that the Jewish people were going to have to be persistent, right? Absolute, uh, 100% persistent followers of God, if they were going to make it through, and to be all honest, the nightmare and hell that the Jewish people were going to have to endure. I mean, you want to talk about hell on earth. These people lived out hell on earth, uh, according to Daniel chapter 8, and the, the history that we're going to see this morning. And so it was a really terrible circumstance that they were going to be put in. And if they were going to be able to survive, they were going to have to be persistent. You know, my daughter Piper, she's, she's pretty persistent. She's starting to be able to talk and formulate words. And she really loves these little cards that we have. We put them in tens, and she'll just stand there, and she'll dump them out, and then she'll put them in just one after the other. And sometimes she'll look at them, but she's very systematic and very organized. And if one has just a little teeny tiny crease on it, she tosses it. And so we get to play 52 card pickup almost every single day of our lives. It is exhausting having to pick up these cards every day, but she, she really likes it. And so we store it in this middle container in the front of our, uh, in front of our, our living room. It's like a chest or whatever. And this drawer, and we put them all in there, and she'll go up there, and she'll say please, but it comes out differently. It's a D, a D, please. She wants her cards. And I'm sitting there watching football, and I really don't want to get up, and so I'll act like I'm asleep. And she'll run up to me and yell at me and wake me up. And I'm like, hey, what's up? And she'll walk back over, and she literally won't stop until I actually go get her cards. It's the most annoying thing ever. So I get up, and I go get her cards. She's very, very persistent. And she gets it from her mother, all right? <clears throat> Her mother is very, very persistent. Right now, Angel is prego, and so she's having food cravings and pregnancy cravings, and she is relentless when she wants something that has to do with her pregnancy craving, like she wants me to go get her Starbucks. And so she'll say, hey, you know, it'd be really great if we could share coffee together. Share coffee together, right? And, and then five minutes later, she'll be like, hey, what do you think about going out and getting some Starbucks? And I'm like, nah, I just, you know, it's the morning. I don't really want to go out. And so she'll sit there, and she'll be like, man, it would be really great to have some Starbucks right now. I'm pregnant, Rick. You don't have to do anything during this pregnancy. Go get me some Starbucks. And I'm like, fine, I'll, I'll go get you some Starbucks. So I'll get up and I'll go get a Starbucks. Very, very persistent. I'm sorry, Angel. I know that I'm embarrassing you right now, but that's the price you pay for being a preacher's wife. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> have, you ever thought about, have you ever thought about the ark? Like snails, for instance. I mean, how long would it take snails to get to the ark? I mean, you're talking about persistence. You know what I mean? I mean, they're just wiggling themselves along to this gigantic boat. You have to got some pers persistence if a snail's going to get to an ark. There's this really cool Japanese proverb. It says this. You don't have to lie awake at night in order to succeed. You just have to stay awake during the day. There's no poverty that can overtake persistence. Right? You don't have to stay awake at night in order to succeed. You just have to stay awake during the day and be persistent. Keep going. Don't give up. Don't stop. And that's really what Daniel 8 is about. Look, Jewish nation, you're going to go through some stuff. And it's going to be the most horrific experience that you've ever been through. But do not give up. Keep pushing forward. Persist. And so in Daniel chapter 8, verses 1, we find Daniel recalling this dream uh, that he had in the third year of Belshazzar. And if you remember, we ended Daniel chapter 6 with the Persian nation taking over Babylon. And so Daniel chapter 8 is another flashback, just like we had last week. He's looking back into the past, and he's saying, I want to share a dream that I had um, during the reign of Belshazzar in the kingdom of Babylon. And so verse 1 says, in the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, a king, uh, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously. That was Daniel chapter 7. 
I looked in the vision, and while I was looking, I was in the citadel of Susa, which is in the province of Elam. And I looked in the vision, and I myself was beside the Eli Canal. And so Daniel is, at this time, a representative of the kingdom of Babylon. He's very prominent. He has a lot of power. I've got a map for you up on the screen, which it shows you where Daniel takes uh, this dream, where Daniel has this vision. There's a little yellow circle um, around Susa, which is in the province of, of Elam. And so we don't know from the language whether or not Daniel was actually there or whether or not Daniel was just having a vision as if he appeared there. But it is totally acceptable to think that Daniel is actually in Persia at this moment as a representative of Babylon, and he has this terrible nightmare about the future of the Jewish people. And so this takes place about 52 to 54 BC, and like I said, it's about two years after Daniel chapter 7. And so Daniel tells us what this dream uh, was, what this vision was. He says in verse 3, Then I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a ram which had two horns was standing in front of a canal. And the two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, with a longer one coming up last. And I saw a ram budding westward, northward, and southward, and no other beast could stand before him, nor was there anyone to rescue him from his power, but he did as he pleased, and he magnified himself. If you remember from last week, the dream, the beasts in the dream, there were four, they represented various nations. And so the same principle is going to apply here. He goes on in verse 5. While I was observing, behold, a male goat, so a different animal, was coming from the west, very important, over the surface of the whole earth without even touching the ground. What kind of symbolism, what kind of metaphors is happening here? A goat obviously has to walk in order to transport itself, right? But it's moving so fast that it's not even touching the ground. He says, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between its eyes, and he came up to the ram that had the two horns, which I had seen standing in front of the canal, and he rushed at him with a mighty wrath. And I saw him come beside the ram, and he was enraged at him, and he struck the ram, and he shattered the two horns. And the ram had no strength to withstand him. So he hurled him to the ground and trampled on him, and there was none to rescue the ram from his power. Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly, but as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken. And in its place there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came forth a small horn that grew exceedingly great towards the south and the east and towards the beautiful land. The beautiful land would be towards Israel. Now, don't get it mixed up with the horn of last week, okay? This is a totally, completely separate dream. They are not written in chronological history. This is not a continuation. This is a dream that is absolutely separate from last week. So we got another little horn who rises up among the four. And it grew up towards the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth and it trampled them down. The host of heaven would typically represent the people of God throughout scripture. And so this uh, little horn is going to go towards the beautiful land and he's going to wage war and wrath against the people of God. Verse 11, it magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host. So He's going to be claiming to be equal with God. And it says, and it removed the regular sacrifice from him. And the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. And so this little horn is not only going to claim to be God, but when it comes to God's people, it's going to remove uh, the sacrifices to God that were performed evening and morning. And he's going to throw down God's sanctuary. Verse 12 says, on account of his transgression, the host will be given over to the horn along with a regular sacrifice. And it will fling the truth to the ground, and it will perform, and it will prosper. So here is a horn that's going to wage war against the people of God, and it's going to win. Daniel's going to be really upset at this. Daniel had been through a lot, and once again, he foresees in the distant future God's people losing again. It says in verse 13, he says, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another one said to that particular one who was speaking, How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply while the transgression causes horror so as to allow the holy place and the host to be trampled? How long is this persecution going to last, in other words? And he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be destroyed. 
And so thankfully, right, this is maybe confusing, you're not really sure what's going on, but Daniel straight up gets the exact interpretation of the dream. And so things are going to be really easy for us this morning. Look, look what happens here according to verse 15. When I saw Daniel, when I, Daniel, had the vision, I sought to understand it. And we should too. We should seek to understand exactly what it is that God is trying to tell his people. And so I hope that as we have gone through the book of Daniel, as we go through the book of Daniel, you will continue to seek and study out these symbols and these visions in order to understand what it is God is trying to say. And he said, behold, standing before me was one like a man. And I heard the voice of the man between the banks of a lie. And he called out and said, Gabriel, give this man an understanding of this vision. And so if you were going to try to understand this vision, who should you go to? the book of Daniel. Let Daniel interpret his own dream. And so, rightfully so, he gets this understanding according to verse 17. And he says, so he came near to where I was standing. And when he came, I was frightened and I fell on my face. And so this type of angelic being or possibly a theophany, a pre-incarnate view of God comes before Daniel to give him the interpretation and he is so afraid that he falls down. And this, this angel said to him, son of man, understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. The end of what? Not the end of the world, the end of the transgression, the end of the persecution, the end of the question that was addressed in verse 14. So don't make this confusing, right? Don't cast this into the future to be the end of the world. It was to be the end of the persecution of the abomination that caused desolation and the future for the Jewish people. And it says in verse 18 that while he was talking with me, I sank into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. He passed out. But he touched me and he made me stand upright. And he said, behold, I'm going to let you know what will occur at the final period of the indignation, for it pertains to the appointed time of the end, the end of the persecution, the end of the transgression, the end of what the Jewish people were going to go through. And so he gives them this interpretation. Verse 8, or chapter 8, verse 20, he says, the ram which you saw with the two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia. Last week, the animal that represented Media and Persia was the bear. The uh, several weeks before in Daniel chapter 2, what represented Media and Persia were the arms and the chests of silver, right? They were an inferior nation. And so what he is saying is there's going to be this ram with lopsided horns, which represents the Medio Persian Empire, and it's going to go eastward and northward and southward, and no one is going to be able to stop it. Pretty point of blank interpretation. And he says in verse 21, the shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece. And the large horn between that eyes is the first king. And so, very simply put it, if you're following along in your app and you're filling in the blank, Medio Persia is the uh, ram and Greece is the goat with the long horn. Now we have to ask ourselves this question. Out of the Greece empire, what is the greatest king that has ever been known that pretty much conquered the world? Alexander the Great. That's who he's talking about. And so this horn that grows out from the goat is going to move so fast across the world, he's going to conquer the world so fast that he's not even going to touch the ground. And that's exactly what we find in history. But at the climax of Alexander the Great's empire, when he was 33 years old, he died. And that's exactly what the vision says. When he grew to be the greatest, the horn broke off and four horns grew in its place. Alexander the Great was so fast, he was so powerful, he defeated the Persian, the Medo-Persian Empire in three distinct battles, which you see up on the screen, and he conquered the entire world. And so you see this map of the, the, the ram with the two horns moving eastward and north and south, conquering the whole world, and then out of nowhere comes the kingdom of Greece, led by Alexander the Great, who's going to take over the entire world even faster than the Medo-Persian Empire. And he says in verse 22 that the broken horn and the four horns that arose in its place represent four kingdoms which will arise from his nation, although not with his power. And so they're going to be inferior. And if you look at the map up on the screen, you will see that this nation was divided up into four different nations. Alexander the Great had four generals, and he appointed them to uh, oversee these different provinces. And so when Alexander died tragically, these four took over their various dimensions. We've got the Ptolemy who took over Egypt. We've got the Seleucius Empire that took over Syria, as you can see, the largest part of the empire. Cassander took over Macedonia and Greece, Alexander's home. And then Lysimachus took over Thrace and Asia Minor, which were two smaller inferior kingdoms. And so this is exactly what we find in history. 
And this is what's so incredible about the book of Daniel, is that he's writing in the 6th century B.C. This happened 400 years later. God's prophecy is incredible, it is awesome, and it's so detail-oriented that it's caused some scholars who don't like the Bible and don't trust the Bible, they look at it and they say, this is impossible. There's no way this type of history could have been written 400 years before the fact. This has got to be a forgery, but it wasn't. Their arguments are just weak, and they're false, and they're not really good. And so that really shows us the power of God's word, that God gets it right every time. But we've got some tragedy that's going to take place. And this is horrific, what happened. And I'm going to explain it to you. Daniel chapter 8, verses 23 and 25 says this. And the latter period of their rule, these four kings, when the transgressors have run their course, a king will arise. This is the small horn. Insolent, skilled in intrigue. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power. And he will destroy an extraordinary degree and prosper and will perform his will. He will destroy mighty men and the holy people. And through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence. He will magnify himself in his heart. He will destroy many people while they are at ease. He will even oppose the prince of princes. This is a a title of divinity. Have you ever heard Jesus called the prince of peace? Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and following. This is a a title of divinity. He will even oppose God, make himself equal with God. But then something's going to happen. He too will be broken. He will persecute God's people. Terrible things are going to take place. But God will break this man who opposes him. And so what is, what is this talking about? What does this mean? Well, out of the Seleucid Empire grew a man called Antiochus Epiphanes. And he reigned from 175 to 163 BC. And I've got a picture up for you. You can find this. This is all throughout history. And he uh, attacked the other kingdoms. He grew to be one of the most prominent kings of the entire world. He certainly magnified himself to be the people of God. And Antiochus Epiphanes is the small horn of Daniel chapter 8. Josephus, who was a Jewish historian in the first century, this was common knowledge. Everyone in the Jewish world believed that Daniel was speaking about Antiochus Epiphanes. Let me read you a quote from, from, from Josephus. He said, and indeed it was so, and it came to pass, that our nation suffered these things under Antiochus Epiphanes, according to Daniel's vision, and what he wrote many years before they came to pass. And so Antiochus Epiphanes was the small horn who grew up, and he waged war against the people of God. He actually even created his own coins, which they have found in archaeology, and he claimed to be Antiochus Epiphanes, God manifest. That's what he changed his name to be, God in the flesh. Sound familiar? Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus came to be God in the flesh. And so Antiochus wanted to be all that which the Jewish scriptures represented as the divine status. When he took over Jerusalem, he actually, through his cunningness and his shrewdness, he came with a large force, and you can read about this in history, and he approached with peace. I have not come to destroy you. He lied to the people, the people let him in, and he slaughtered them. He killed them. He set up uh, an image of himself in the temple. He actually took a swine, which is a pig, which was forbidden by the Jews at that time. It was a ceremonial restriction. And just as an act of defiance and shrewdness and hate, he took a gigantic pig and he put it upon the altar of God and he sacrificed a pig on the altar of God, thus causing, it was an abomination that caused desolation. The Jews could no longer use that altar as a sacrifice. He encouraged the Greek soldiers to commit fornication in the temple. Go have sex, sleep with whoever you want, defile the temple of of the people of God. He actually forbade circumcision. So the Jews were no longer to circumcise their people. And he forced them to to carry out this rule. And if they didn't, he would execute the children. uh, And he would actually hang the children around the mother's neck. He possessed a copy um, of the scriptures, and only he and he alone was allowed to uphold the Jewish scriptures and have them, and he forbade any type of Old Testament Bible being given throughout uh, the land, and if you were found with the scriptures, you were to be executed. You can actually look at the Maccabean Revolt. If you study this throughout history, uh, the Maccabees wrote about their resistance against Antiochus Epiphanes and how they won. And the Maccabees write in 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verses 41 through 64, They give this account of the type of person that Antiochus was, and I'd like to read it to you this morning. When Antiochus entered the land, they said many people, even from Israel, gladly adopted his religion. I mean, think about it. How many of us, if the government came to us today, and they said, if you continue to practice Christianity, you're going to be executed, 
we're going to kill your children, we're going to tie them around the necks of their mothers, and you're going to have to wear them until we tell you to take them off. I mean, think about that for a second. It is horrific. It's terrible. And so a death sentence happened to anyone who was a Jew who practiced according to Judaism. That's how much Antiochus Epiphanes hated Judaism. The Maccabees recalled, he directed them to follow customs strange to the land, to forbid burnt offerings and sacrifices and drink offerings in the sanctuary, to profane Sabbaths and feasts, to defile the sanctuary and the priests, to build altars and sacred precincts and shrines for idols, to sacrifice swine and unclean animals, and to leave their sons uncircumcised. They were to make themselves abominable by everything unclean and profane. Hey guys, everything that God told you to do, it is now the law of the land. You need to do the exact opposite. The exact opposite of what God tells you to do. They go on in verse 49, so that they should forget the law and change the ordinances. And whoever does not obey the king shall die. They write in verse 56 that the books of the law which they found, they tore to pieces, they burned with fire, where the book of the covenant was found in the possession of anyone, or anyone who adhered to the law, the, the decree of the king condemned them to death. So you can only imagine what it would be like to live in this type of environment, this type of culture, where war had been waged against the Jewish people and they had a death sentence on their head, and it was an incredible amount of sacrifice and pain that they had to go through. But what do you think these people uh, held on to throughout their time of persecution? If there was any book in the Old Testament that they would cling to, saying this book provides us hope, our pain isn't going to last forever, it would be the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 8, verse 25, if you'll remember, it says, this horn, he, Antiochus, will be broken without human agency. This terrible thing is going to happen, but God isn't going to let it last forever. And you can actually read in history just how terrible Antiochus Epiphanes died. It was an excruciating death that this man went through. And the Maccabees actually tell us about it. When he grew so angry against the Jewish people, he set out on a full steam ahead. He was going to slaughter them. He was going to kill them. And they write in, in the book of Maccabees, first, or 2 Maccabees chapter 9, they say, breathing out fire and his rage against the Jews and giving orders to drive even faster. So it came about that he fell out of his chariot as it was rushing along and he fell so hard as to torture every limb of his body. And so in a fit of rage, he whips the horses forward, they take off, he falls out of his chariot and he busts some t- something internally which causes every single aspect of his body to break out in excruciating pain. Maybe those of you in the medical professional uh, field would be able to tell us what kind, of, uh, what kind of internal damage that he had happened to him. But it's, they go on to write, thus he who was only a little while before, and look at what they said he thought about himself. He had superhuman arrogance that he could command the ways of the sea. And he had imagined that he could weigh the high mountains in the balance. And so the ungodly man's body was swarmed with worms. He had fell to the ground and his body began to go, undergo decay. And it says, while he was still living in anguish and pain, his flesh began to rot away. And because of the stench of the whole army felt revulsion at his decay, because of his intolerable stench, no one was able to carry the man who had so little while before he had thought he could touch the stars of heaven. Here was this guy who thought he was so great, falls out of his chariot and begins to die and rot and decay with excruciating amount of pain. You would think a person like this would deserve a death such as this for the amount of pain and torture and tragedy caused upon people. Not even not Jewish people who are more important than everyone else, but just people. And so they write, so the murderer and blasphemer, having endured a more intense suffering, such as he inflicted on others, came to the end of his life by a most pitiful fate among the mountains in a strange land. And so we see prophecy coming to fulfillment. Jewish people, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be hated. You're going to go through things that are terrible, but it will not last. It's not going to go on forever. There is hope that you can hold on to. And so the angel cried out, how long is this going to happen, if you remember? And they said 2,300 evenings and mornings. And some scholars take this to be 2,300 days. I personally believe in the context of scripture, it's talking about the abomination that causes desolation. It's talking about sacrifices. They offered sacrifices every morning and every evening. And so the real question is, is how long is this going to take place? Well, it's going to take place for 2,300 sacrifices, both in the evening and the morning, and that cuts the amount of time in half. It's not going to last forever. 
And so a key scripture that I would focus in on that the Jewish people had to cling to was simply this. Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. Maybe you're going through pain. Maybe you have suffered tragedy. Maybe there are circumstances and situations and conflicts, maybe in your family this Christmas. Maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe you're even waging war against yourself. It's not going to last forever. This also will pass. And this is what's so cool. This is the origination of Hanukkah. Because when Antiochus Epiphanes died, the abomination that caused desolation lasted for so uh, many times, uh, 1,150 days. And in December uh, 14th, Judas Maccabees actually went into the temple and he removed all the stones and he went out and placed them on a mountain. And they rebuilt the altar and they celebrated Hanukkah as a reminder that God is going to win. Our persecution isn't going to last forever. And I think that's so beautiful. It's so powerful, uh, and it's something that we should reflect on and think about. And look what happened to Daniel. Chapter 8, verses 27. He was fainted. He was sick to his stomach. He saw this terrible persecution that was going to go on, and he says, it, it, just, it just can't be. God, how could you let us go through this? But God says it's going to happen, but you can rest on this promise. It will end. And so we can reflect on the amazing aspect of Scripture. We can reflect about the powerfulness of God's Word and how, just like the, the Maccabees who revolted against Antiochus and they clung unto the promise of God, so we too can cling to the promises of God that our pain, our defeat, the triumph of the world will not last forever. And so let's focus on some things that we can take away from this story. Well, the first thing is you all know about me, man. I love Christmas. And so I can't help but think about a Christmas reflection. Now, one of the things Antiochus was going to do is he was going to throw the truth to the ground. And that's what he did. He removed the law. He made everyone practice falsehood. And so he attacked the truth of God. And something I think that we can do this morning is as Christians, we must focus on the true light of the world. There's a lot of distractions today. There were a lot of distractions back then. A lot of people have a different form of truth. They have redefined Christmas and what it means to be a Christian. They have taken the focus off of God being the source of morality and truth and value and have substituted for self-sufficiency. Buy things for yourself. Don't, don't worry about giving and helping people out in need. After all, we'll probably just take advantage of you, right? I mean, you see somebody out on the corner, he's probably just going to buy drugs. You see somebody that's in need, it's probably because they're over-entitled. And we, our minds are attacked. And, and the world wants us to stop giving and doing good things. And so we have to remove that and focus on what does the Bible say? What is the truth of God's word? And it's the light of the world that we should focus on. John wrote this in, in John chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. This is John the Baptist. And he came as a witness to do what? To testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light. But he came to testify about the light. There was the true light which came, and coming into the world enlightens every man. And so this Christmas, don't get distracted by falsehood. Don't get distracted by uh, antichrist. Don't get distracted by the things of materialism and narcissism and things that cause you to think and elevate yourself. Focus on the light of the world, that Jesus came to sacrifice himself as a ransom for all. Secondly, this Christmas, we should shine the light on the good news that God is in control. And although we think that Donald Trump is in control, or that the people who are waging a war against him and the liberal media are in control, or the powers that be are in control, the one world government, no one's in control but God. God is self-sufficient. God is in control. Isaiah had to remind the people about this when he talked about the persecution that was coming upon the, the Jewish nation. He said, God says, remember the former things long of past, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times which things have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established. I will accomplish all that is according to my pleasure. I will call a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a far country. Truly I have spoken, truly I will bring it to pass, I have planned it, surely I will do it. God promised to send a son named Jesus, Emmanuel, to die for the sins of the world, and God kept his promise. God promises us that he won't give us anything more that we can bear. God will keep his promise. God promises that he will work for the greater good of everyone that loves him and is called according to his purpose. God will keep his promise. God promised the Jewish nation that you're going to go through a horrible persecution, but it will end. I will act. 
And God kept his promise. God is in control. And though you may suffer, and though you may be persecuted, and though you may have doubts, and though you may have pain, God is ultimately in control, and he keeps his promises. What did God promise by sending his son Jesus into the world? Luke chapter 2, verse 14, God's plan for us. Glory be to God, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. It is God's purpose and plan that you would have a good relationship with him. And so what are you doing to have that type of relationship? So we need to be persistent in following a good God, just as we need to be persistent in following the true light. And then number three, when considering your persecution and pain, you may be tempted to withhold goods from other people, withhold doing good to other people. I think everybody in this room has probably been betrayed and hurt at one time. I mean, I would be exceedingly hurt if our church were to undergo some type of persecution and half of you would just abandon Christianity and not stand up for the truth of God's word. That's exactly what the Jewish nation was, was undergoing. I mean, your fellow brothers and sisters who were sacrificing, were praising God, they, they had given up. They were sacrificing to a pagan God. They were doing things that they shouldn't do. They were operating outside of God's laws, and that would be incredibly hurtful to me. And I, and I would think that it would be incredibly hurtful to you as well. I mean, can you imagine if I'm up here preaching the word, and next thing you know, some scandal breaks out about some life that I was living as a lie behind the screen, uh, behind, the, behind the stage. I mean, that would be awful, wouldn't it? And that's exactly what they were going through. And a lot of us, we get betrayed and hurt by our family members, our friends, maybe even in the church. We get disappointed. We, we get sad when we hear the news. But we can't let that destroy us from doing good. Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10 says this. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we will, re we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have every opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Don't give up. Don't give up giving. Don't give up doing. Don't give up loving. Don't give up being the person that God has commanded you to be. Don't grow weary, for at the proper time, you will reap a harvest. And so we need to be persistent in our faithfulness of doing good to others. And then finally, just like the Maccabees who fought against evil, we must be persistent in the fight of faith against our own evil and the evil that we face externally. I don't know about you, but I'm a sinner. I make mistakes. I mess up. My life isn't perfect. I battle against sin in my own heart, in my own mind, in my own actions. I get angry. I have bad thoughts. I do bad things. And I'm probably one of the worst sinners in this room. I'm a sinner. But we need to still follow God even though we make mistakes. We need to still fight the faith even though we're not perfect. And so in a sense, we do need to let go of the past that enables us to follow God into the future. Proverbs chapter 24 verse 16 says, For a righteous man falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in the time of calamity. Don't give up. Don't lose the battle. So what if you made a mistake yesterday? So what if you sinned an hour ago? So what if you fought on the way here to church with your family? So what if you thought bad thoughts as you came? Let it go. Stand back up. Don't fall down. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 and 12 says this. Paul said to Timothy, You, man of God, pursue righteousness and godliness and faith and love and perseverance and gentleness. Don't pursue the things of the world. Keep pursuing the things of God. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life which you were called and which you made the good confession and the presence of many witnesses. And so be persistent in fighting the good fight. Resolve in your hearts, I am going to follow God even when I make mistakes and my culture's against me. I will not lose hope. That is the story of Daniel chapter 8. And so I'd like to conclude with you with this thought. In the 13th century, Genghis Khan, he asked his philosophers, he was one of the most powerful leaders that the world has ever seen, he took the world by storm, he asked his philosophers to come up with a saying, to come up with a truth that would be forever eternal, that would never uh, lose its meaning or its purpose. And here's what they said. It too shall pass. I like that. This too shall pass. And so whether you're in a good time or in a bad time, this too shall pass. For the Maccabean revolt against Antiochus Epiphanes, this too shall pass. For the persecutions of Christians in Rome in the first century, this too shall pass. 
and the persecution of Christianity in America, if it grows, if it decreases, this too shall pass. But there's something even greater that we as Christians can say. We can say, and it came to pass. We can look back in the history of time, of God's fulfilled promises, and we can say, God has kept his word. It came to pass. God, I trust you. You are faithful. You are true. I trust you. The story of Antiochus Epiphanes is one that shook the course of history. And the Maccabees write this. When Antiochus Epiphanes attacked them and persecuted them, he says, they kept using violence against Israel, against those found month after month in the cities. They sought us out. They hunted us down. They wouldn't give up. And on the 25th day of the month, they offered sacrifice on the altar, which was upon the altar of burnt offerings. This is when they took a pig and they threw it up there. And they did the most terrible thing in the mind of a Jew that you could ever do. And it says, according to the decree, they put to death the women who had their children circumcised and their families and those who circumcised them. And they hung the infants from their mother's neck. But this is so very important. But many in Israel stood firm and were resolved in their hearts not to eat unclean food. They chose to die rather than to be defiled by food or to profane the holy covenant. And they did die. And very great wrath came upon Israel. They made a decision in their heart. I'm going to follow God and I'm not going to give in because I trust God and I believe in his promises. And that's the encouragement that I want to give you this morning. Resolve in your heart this morning what type of person that you're going to be, what type of Christian that you're going to be, what type of actions are going to define you. And you know one of the greatest promises of Scripture was when Jesus hung on the cross and he said, it is finished. This too shall pass. And it came to pass. And Jesus died for the world, for the sins of everybody in this room. And so you this morning can make the decision. Do you want to follow God? Have you obeyed the gospel? Have you committed yourself to Jesus, to follow him, to cash in on his promises, and to trust him? You have the opportunity to do that this morning. The Bible says if you're willing to turn away from your sin and be baptized in water, you too can have the forgiveness of, of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you can have a relationship with God that will last forever. All it takes is your willing heart. And so I'm going to ask that you stand and pray with me as we prepare our hearts for the song of invitation. Lord, for today we give you thanks. God, we look at what your people have endured in the past and we're sad, our hearts are broken and it's a tragedy of what families had to go through, such terrible tragedy. But God, I thank you for those women, those men, those children who loved you so much that they refused to back down, they refused to give in, they stood strong on your promises, hoping for a better future. And so God, I pray that we'll be encouraged this Christmas, that we'll be courageous this Christmas, and that our lives would be defined by your promises, not the problems of the world. Lord, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for sending your own son to die on a cross for our sins. And it's in his name that we pray and we sing. Amen.